Well, welcome to our Christmas service. This is our uh, most exciting service of the year. It's normally our biggest. And uh, some of us can't get, wait to get out of here because we've got a big party banquet tonight. And there's a talent show and I hear some terrible rapping is being organized and all sorts of different things is going on. But we want to welcome you here. Uh, I want to, we're here to celebrate Christmas. And there's a lot to celebrate. That was our little church video. We've only been going three years. 12 people came here. Most of those were missionaries, so they've gone back. So this is a real special celebration for us. But Christmas is actually a time where, as Father Christmas says, we're meant to be celebrating Christ. And people actually don't really celebrate Christ because they don't really understand what life without Christ would be like. If Christ had never existed, there are some teachings that exist today that we take for granted that most people just don't understand wouldn't. Christ came and taught, love your enemies. That is such a radical concept even today. If in the Middle East people just obeyed those three words, love your enemies, just how incredible would the world be? We're here to celebrate that that teaching came from Jesus. And most of it in this room, even if we're not Christians, we actually understand that concept and we try and practice that even if we're not Christians. The concept of forgiving people as opposed to vengeance, as opposed to tribalism, that because you killed my family, I'll kill yours. That's an unbelievable concept that most people don't hold on to today. Most people hold on to the fact of, let me tell you why I can justify my bitterness. You know, having only one woman for a wife. Yeah. <laughs> That's not found in other religions, in most cultures. How would the women in here like to be just one of many? I'm sure you're fired up about the fact that Jesus taught one woman, one husband. Amen. I hope you're fired up about that. Amen. <laughs> The equality of the sexes. Jesus raised the role of women up. Amen. You know, we'd all have to be Jews sacrificing animals if Jesus didn't come. That would not be a good thing to be doing. Walking in here with your goat saying, where do I pour the blood? There's so much to celebrate, but that's the whole thing about Christianity. Christmas, people don't understand what life would have been like without Jesus Christ actually coming. We take him for granted. Familiarity is breed contempt. And you know, you may not believe in Jesus, but you sure have been impacted by his teachings, whether you like it or not. If you're from the Western world, nearly all of our governments bases its doctrines, its belief systems, its healthcare on teachings that Jesus gave us. So we need to be grateful for Jesus Christ. Amen. If you turn your Bibles to Acts 22, verse 1, I'm going to touch on three things that we need to celebrate. And as a church, we definitely celebrate. We celebrated in that video. And the first point is anybody can change. Anybody can change. I don't know anybody that I've ever met that doesn't want to change something. They might want to change their weight, their nose, their ears, their pant size, their feet, um, some mole they have, uh, their way, their teeth. Everybody wants to change something. What does that tell you? It tells you that most people actually aren't happy with who they are. They're not. They don't feel comfortable in their own skin. But more than that, most people don't feel comfortable with their own character. They hate the fact that they are lazy or they're indisciplined or they want to be kind and they're not kind. They want to have a great relationship with somebody of the opposite sex and yet they keep messing up, they keep being insensitive or they don't. People want to change. And Christianity is all about change and anybody can change. And that's what we saw all those people who became Christians. They went, at last, a way to change. You know, we're going to take a look at one person in the Bible that you would have thought wouldn't want to have changed or wouldn't have changed. And that's the Apostle Paul in Acts 22. And here he, he's, after he's being a Christian, he's actually telling people his conversion story. He's going through it and you're going, he's going, look, guys, if I can change, you can change. 
But in Acts 22 verse 1 he says, Brothers and fathers, now listen to my defence. So he's standing on these steps and he's talking to people, Guys, listen to me. I want to tell you my conversion story. It says, When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a Sicilia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can testify themselves can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul talks off and goes, Look, let me just introduce myself. I was a believer in God. I knew the Bible absolutely. I was zealous. I mean, when it comes to zeal, I'll tell you how zealous I was. I got into my head that actually this, these Christians, these groups of Christians, they were evil. They were actually blasphemous. So I, you know what? I made it my point in life to find them, persecute them, throw them in prison and kill them. Paul was an angry man, but he was religious and he was a Christian killer. Now, if you think about the sort of person that wouldn't change, you go, well, somebody that hated and killed Christians, surely that's the sort of person you go, OK, he's not going to change. He's not the one, you know, maybe this nice, quiet, kind person over there that hasn't really got much going on in their life. But the guy standing opposite you that is trying to kill you in the name of God. Now that person's not going to change. And yet it goes on. It says, about noon I came near Damascus. Suddenly a light, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you'll be told all that you'll be assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. You know, Jesus had to literally appear to the Apostle Paul to make him wake up and make him understand that what he was doing was wrong. Why was he blinded? Well, he was blinded for three days. I believe he was blinded to make him realize how lost he was. You know, the, the hardest people to convince that they are lost are religious people. Paul believed in God. Many people go, I'm a Christian because I believe in God. He knew his Bible. He goes, you can't tell me I'm not saved. I read my Bible. I'm zealous for God. I know it. Paul was all of those things. All those things that most people go, I am saved because I believe in God. I read my Bible. I am incredibly zealous. Those things on their own do not mean that you are saved. Let's be honest. Most so-called Christians aren't even at that stage. They hardly read their Bible, hardly know it, and they're definitely not zealous. Given an opportunity to go to the beach or a free ticket to a movie, they'll miss church. They'll go to church when there's nothing else to do. And yet he was blinded for three days. Why? God said, Paul, I want you to emotionally understand that you are in the darkness. You are lost. All of your religious deeds don't make you saved. You have got it wrong. He was obedient because he was given a task to do, get up. A difficult task now because he was blind. God expects obedience, not just wishful thinking. It says, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. So Paul went through this journey four days beforehand, like Wednesday. On Wednesday, this guy Paul was like, I am right before God. I am fired up. I know what my mission in life is. My mission in life is to kill Christians. That's my mission in life. And within a four day period, he's been told he is wrong. He's had a personal visitation from Jesus. He has been blinded and he goes on to have a personal healing experience 
for his own blindness. And yet, was he saved at this point? Absolutely not. When I think about the justifications people give today to being saved, I read my Bible. I'm zealous for God. I've even had a personal healing from God. Therefore, you cannot say I'm not saved. Jesus has even personally appeared to me. You know, when we first started the church, we studied the Bible with someone who literally told us, I was on the seat of my bed. Jesus personally appeared to me. Therefore, I know I am saved because Jesus does not personally appear to people and leave without them being saved. I go, well, in this passage, that, that actually says that's not true. Jesus came, had a personal conversation and left. Because God wanted to see whether Paul was humble. You know, you can see that you're wrong. You ever done that? You go, I know you're wrong. I know I'm wrong. You're in an argument and you go, they're right. They're right. But there's no way I'm going to tell them they're right. There's just no way. Your heart gets really hard. You go, I'm not going, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. You go, you know you're wrong. They even show you proof. They show a photo or something. You go, I I don't care what the photo says. (laughs) We can be like that with the Bible. I don't care what the Bible says. Just I don't care. I feel I feel saved. I feel lots of different emotions. Doesn't mean they're all right. In actual fact, a lot of time they're completely and utterly wrong. And yet he wasn't saved. And it says, Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You'll be his witnesses to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. There it is right there, the Apostle Paul. The point of salvation is where you have your sins forgiven. That's the only difference between me and when I was lost. One day I had my sins forgiven, and one day I hadn't. And he said, in order to have your sins forgiven, in order to have them washed away, you are baptized. That is the point of salvation. That's why we celebrate the baptism. If the Apostle Paul could become a Christian, so can anybody. In order to give, become a Christian, he had to give up his job. I mean, his job was Christian killing, so he had to give that up. <laughs> he most probably lost all of his friends. Why? Because they were Christian killers too. He lost his income. He lost his future dreams. It's quite possible that he lost his wife, because Pharisees were more than likely married. And he had to be so humble, because now he had to go and worship with the people whose family members he had killed. Talk about an awkward moment in church. Hi guys, I've repented. Really? Yet anybody can change. No, there is no doubt about it. There is such excitement when people understand this. I remember studying the Bible with a guy called Min Tran from Vietnam. And I, he only took three days to get baptized. And I remember why. He, go, he sat me down and he went, You're saying every single sin that I have done is forgiven when I get baptized. I went, yeah. He went, every single one. He said, yeah. He says, where's the water? I said, well, we need to go through what sins there are. Okay, but let's do that quickly. Where's the water? He really got it. He was like, right, I'm just telling you all my sins. And that's it. When you see light at the end of the tunnel... That's what makes you that open. You go, wow, I can change. You know, I think about some of the incredible uh, changes here. I remember Ayo. Maybe Ayo was a little bit like Paul. He had a bit of struggle. I don't think Jesus appeared to him, but Eric Deng definitely did. Um, (laughs) And uh, there was a real, I remember being in Starbucks and he's going, I'm lost. I remember generally heart-wise going, man, I'm lost. I'm bursting into tears. And yet there was that wrestle afterwards for maybe three weeks or so. But it's so great to see him uh, become a Christian this year. And not only that, this is really cool. So we started a church in Nigeria this year. And um, uh, yeah, Lagos, Nigeria. And Ayo, you know, has now become a Christian and suddenly finds out that his ex-girlfriend has been studying the Bible with the church in uh, Lagos. So you see that God can organize anything. He didn't invite her to church. God was doing this. Oh, so he's got to go back to Lagos on Tuesday. I go, okay. She might have a few questions. Hey, oh, you, you, remember when you mistreated me? Can we uh, talk about that? <laughs> God's always trying to work on somebody's humility. Great to have our first uh, POM Englishman, Carl, baptized in the church. Sitting there, okay. 
Um, just, just some really, Manny, okay, our new funky dancer, amen. Uh, Hank the Tank, who served us so well behind the camera, great to get with his parents this morning. Uh, the Doc, great to see his family here. Did a great job with their son. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Fu, uh, not forgetting Jess uh, from Hong Kong to join our Hong Kong mission team. Uh, we got the, uh, the Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian on in the uh, church now, first Egyptian. And then of course we've got a few Samoans in the house today. Whoop, whoop, okay. Scott, Scotty, the, oh, your mates are over there, mate. What's going on? Oh, I don't know what's going on there. But uh, there's so many other people um, who've become Christians. And then of course today, uh, a special day for us. We have Tamara, Gloria and Wesleyan getting baptized after the service. Okay. So literally we'll have our last song and then we will see them get baptized. Uh, all great friends here from China and they're all changed in the background, which is cool. Anybody can change. I know if I can change, you can change. But what's stopping you? Pride? For some of it is, it's just pride. I just, I, I'm uncomfortable with being reliant on other people. For me, the biggest hurdle was I saw I was lost. Because when I said the Bible, I was sitting there and going, I'm a Christian, puff, puff, smoke, smoke, drug, drugs, drink, drink. I was like, do you realize that's a bit wrong? Okay, you got me. But the hardest thing for me was accepting who else was lost. You know, my family's super religious. And many of us have lost family. And coming to terms with the, that they died on the wrong side, that's tough. That's tough. And yet... I always remember being in the car when we were in Birmingham, England, and uh, one of our dear friends, Kathy, her father had persecuted her all her Christian life. And it was just a really humbling moment. He died and she got to the funeral and was very, very sad. And she said, you know what? I know he wasn't saved, but for the first time in my life, I know right now, he's for me. He's shouting, go, go. You know, we can't do anything about the past. But I know our past family, whether they be great-grandparents, great-great-great-grandparents, those that now know the truth on the other side, every one of them, no matter where they are, is rooting for us to become Christians, or stay Christians, or have a massive impact. And that we need to take comfort of. We may not be able to change the past, but we need to take responsibility for changing the future. And that starts with us today. Point two, true love can be found. John 13, 34. We're looking for love. Aren't, we, aren't you looking for a great wife or a great husband? Isn't that, isn't that, amen. Isn't that difficult? There's a lot of potential out there, isn't there? You go, he'd make a good husband one day if I come back in five years. He needs a bit of work, a bit of shining up. Maybe that's so you go, that woman's great, but geez, a bit of business in there. Just, I don't know if I can handle that. So what's the solution? The truth of it is we're a product of our times, of our parents. Some of that's good, some of that's bad. So we know we need a change. There's part of us we go, I know if I bring this into a marriage, it's not going to work well. So many men, I don't know how it is for women, so many of us say, I will never be like my father. And you know what, who we end up like? Just like our father. I don't know if that's the same for women, but that's just, why? Because the default thing that you fall back to is, is what you remember seeing. So if you see your father watching telly and being selfish, guess what you default to? Watching telly and being selfish. Why? Because you've got no other physical picture in your head. And yet Jesus says, John 13, 34, it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus sets a completely different standard. He goes, you know what? You can tell true disciples if they do exactly what I do. You know, we have so many questions in our life. How do I get on with my mom and my dad? How do I, how do I get on with people at work? How do I, how do I have a relationship? How, how do I function in this world? It's really simple. You go, in any given situation, what would Jesus do? It's that simple. We have so many false teachings in our brain, either from our family, definitely the world does not preach Jesus. If you're thinking that the TV will help you have a good marriage or good relationship, it is not going to. 
It is not going to... Where was the last time you went, you know, here's a new show, okay? Friends, and they all treat each other well. It doesn't happen like that. The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory. A bunch of weirdos. Funny weirdos, but a bunch of weirdos. You really want to be in the Big Bang? You really want to be Penny or, or whatever his name is? Or Sheldon, is that who you really want to date? I don't think so. And yet, all of those programs are a reflection of this is where our society is at today. We relate to those people. How scary to relate to Wallowitz. I mean, that is scary. And yet, that's why they're popular. And Jesus goes, I'm the answer. How do you treat a woman? Study out Jesus, see how he treated women. How do I treat men? Study out Jesus, see how he treated men. How do I treat my parents? Study out how Jesus... But it doesn't feel right. I know, but it is right. If the world could teach you, we'd all have great relationships right now. But that's a problem. Can you find true love? Absolutely. As my wife treats me as Jesus would, I feel loved. You know, I love the church. I love the true friendships. I love seeing the family up there. I love seeing the, the uh, Cantonese girls. You know, there's, there's Jess and Themis and Candice all there. Well, like this, you know, and the Scotty always bombing in the background. Or, you know, <laughs> Esther with a lips up there. I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. We've got great campus universities at Macquarie, at Sydney Uni, at UTS. Seeing the, fam the family of uh, the marriage group coming together, now doubling this year. We have fun. We talk about how to have a good marriage. That's what the church is about. It's about going, okay, what would Jesus do in this situation? Let's talk about it. Let's help one another. Honestly, I truly believe if people understood the counseling we got in this church and how much it helped our marriages, the cues of marriage would be out that door. They'd be out that door. Most people in marriage, they, just, they get used to just leading a, a mediocre marriage. He provides for me. He gives me a house. The fact he doesn't give me much attention, well, I'll just put up with it. And there's no one to turn to. There's no counselling to turn to. I love the dating. You know, Sean and Vatherin, that's a cool dating relationship. I know Vatherin, you know, I've got to say that. So, uh, in Chinese culture, it's quite a big thing for, you know, your parents are like your new boyfriend and stuff. But uh, Sean has now been elevated because his picture is now in Vatherin's parents' home on the wall. Okay, I mean, this, this is dated, so I keep asking him every week, is it still on the wall? Okay, he's like, yeah, it's on the wall. <laughs> That's a big thing, but I'm like, yeah, we, should, we help dating relationships. There's not this breaking up and getting back together and, and cheating on each other and swearing at each other and having fits. We have dating classes to help people. You know, I love the fact, um, you know, we have a, a, a pre-marriage counselling. So that people go into marriages knowing what they're getting into. Yeah. Marriage classes, um, all sorts of great things, because you can find love with Jesus. For some of us go, I don't understand the connection between God and then why I should follow it. That's what the Bible's for. It's the missing link. It's almost like if you're here from another language, like you speak Chinese, you go, I can hardly understand a word he's saying. But if we put an interpreter in the middle, you go, okay, now I understand. The difference is the Bible. You read the Bible, it sort of interprets how to put it into practice. And you go, I got it now. I got it. You know, afterwards, people will come up to you and go, hey, do you want to study the Bible? Say yes. Don't make an excuse. Go, yes. Because the sort of church you're talking about is not like the one I'm going to. You know, and the point three, you know, true meaning can be found in Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Mark 1, 16. Life is boring. Let's be honest, for most of us, life is just dead boring. It is. You try and fill it up with video games or TV shows or just anything rubbish or... Most people wake up and go, really, what am I going to do? And you hope that you sort of get enough money eventually to try and do what you want. But then what you do is you find a job and you become a workaholic because you're bored. So work actually fills that hole and you go, well, now I'm not bored. No, now you're a workaholic. That's not dealing with it. <laughs> That's actually just squashing the reality. Because then you go on holiday and you go, and this is why so many people change jobs over Christmas. They go, really? Was that my year? I devoted myself to this company. I should be really appreciated. And then they fire you in February and you get really bitter. And that's it. That's literally what happens. There's this treadmill. 
You go to school, HSC, pressure, 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 pass your exam to get university. You go to university, pressure, pressure, get into a job. You go, pressure, pressure, job, earn money to get a house. You go, for what? I'm never in my house, I'm always at work. And there's just, it's like, what's the point? And yet true meaning can be found in Mark 1, 16 says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Here were guys that were industrious people. They were actually fishermen. It was their own business. It was their own boats. These Jews had bought into, hey, let's get a career. Let's be entrepreneurs, own our own boat, and let's have a family business. To most people, that's a noble ambition. And yet, they understood once they hit that level, they just got disillusioned. So when Jesus came along and went, hey, you want a different life? They went, sure. I mean, if I just step back for a moment, do I really like smelling a fish? I mean, how does that affect my marriage? Hey, come here, honey. No, don't come here, honey. I mean, you know, really? I'm out there all day in the burning sun. I'm then having to mend on it. It's monotonous. Every job is monotonous. I'm really sorry, if you think that you're going to find this fantastic special job, even people that become rock stars, they go, really, another concert? Really? And yet when you deal with people, this mission of, you know what? As soon as you enter in the concept of my goal in life is to save as many as possible. Doing the ministry, seeking a saving the lost is not boring. It may be many things, but it is not boring. Because you deal with one person after another. I mean, even as an older man, I've not always been a minister, I was in business still five years ago, but the amount of breadth that my life has as a result of that, I've learned so much about cultures. Why? Because I'm focused on so many different people. You know, I've had to ha you know, learn the African darling Jesus. we've got to do all that. You know, I've had to learn the bogling of the Jamaicans, you know, watching rugby league and union, doesn't matter what it is. I'm even having to study, you know, Confucianism, Maoism, learning the different quotes of, you know, the Chinese, uh, different issues of black cats and white cats, doesn't matter which one you have, but you can, they both catch mouse and you just, you know, which words, the, you know, why did Taipei become you know, uh, the Nationalist Party. And you learn so much. Why? Because I'm constantly trying to convert different nations. But if I didn't have that purpose, I'd be this narrow-minded Englishman that would just be nationalistic and walk around saying, my nation is the greatest and looking down on people and alienating people from every different nationality. And that's what most of us are. We're brought up to be nationalistic and look down on other people. And yet, as soon as you try and convert the world, not your community, the world, your life changes. You become different. You eat different foods. You eat chicken feet and you eat, you know, dumplings and, you know, bun and just all sorts of okra soup. Or I would never do that stuff. And you have a real purpose because you're trying to connect with other human beings. And as you learn to do that, the byproduct, your marriage gets better. Your friendships get better. You learn to evangelize on the street, which means your confidence goes up. You learn to uh, debate with people, overcome obstacles. You become unnarrow minded Seeking and saving the lost is a gift given us from God. It keeps us out of sin. It totally does. You're on the phone late at night or stand the Bible with people instead of being struggling with pornography. You come home and you've been evangelizing and you've got your heart into a giving state. So if there's a cup in the sink, you just wash it up because you're training yourself to be selfless. But when we're in religion, where we come to church and we just sit there and criticize and we just go, well, that was a good sermon or it wasn't. What do we do? We go home and we do exactly the same. We criticize our wives. We criticize our kids because we're so others focused. We become takers, not givers. We become spectators. You know, I heard a great sermon uh, this week. And they were talking about what is the difference between true Christianity and false Christianity. It is the concept that you feel pressure. You know, when we watch people run the 100 meters or some sport, we feel no pressure. We may feel exhilaration or excitement. We feel no pressure because we're not running the race. We're excited about, will our person win? And that's how most people want Christianity. I want a service to be exciting. I want the music to be exciting. Entertain me. But then we want opinions. And we want our opinion to be valued to the point 
where we are taken as an expert, but we never participate. And yet the runner, the person in the race, that's the person that feels the pressure. That's the person that really knows what it's like to be a runner. Today, are you a spectator? Or are you a real runner in the race? You know, the true meaning of Christmas, thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus Christ. You know, the power we have in the church is we can go into counseling situations or study the Bible with people. I don't need to be wise. You don't need to be wise. We just go, tell you what, Wikipedia it. What would Jesus do in this situation? Poof, five scriptures. Let's have a look at those. That's it. And life changes because we're called to Jesus' standards. We're not fighting each other. We're not going, well, Cain says, so therefore, Ke well, let's do what Cain... No. We're just doing what Jesus says. You know, Christmas is to celebrate Jesus' birth, his life, and the impact he's had. I'm going to challenge you, this Christmas, what are you going to be celebrating? It's great we have gifts. It's great. It's another way of building friendships, for sure. But the most impacting thing you can do is get the Bible out, read it yourself, or if you're a Christian, get the Bible out and convert somebody. Get into it with your parents in a kind, kind godly way. Get into it with your best friends. I want to commend you, you know, Pete, this time last year on Christmas Eve, did not go to sleep on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, he went to a party and invited Dom to church. As a result, Dom was the first person who became a Christian last year. And Liz is really excited because Liz is dating Dom. So Liz is really excited that Pete, you should hug Pete afterwards. Thank you, Pete, for not going to sleep last Christmas. Every opportunity we have is a moment to change people's lives. You will not start having a great 2017 on January the 1st. Great Januaries are built in Decembers. Great Januaries are built in Decembers. You know, I want to just encourage you and welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a great day, but make it a great year. If somebody asks you to study the Bible, then study the Bible and change your life. And if you're here and you know what's in the Bible, then ask somebody to study the Bible. But now we're going to finish in a song and then we're going to have three very special people come up on stage and they're going to make Jesus Lord of their life and then we're going to baptize them just in the room down there. So amen.